My name is Monk Rowe, and we're in Toronto at the IAJE conference. I'm really pleased to have saxophonist Ernie Watts as my guest today, and I appreciate you taking your time out. Oh, well, thank you. you. Know, I've um, been one of the many, many people who've listened to you over the years and enjoyed your work. I'm wondering, um, at this point in your career, I, is it uh, difficult to make a switch to recording your own work, kind of transitioning from that studio life that you had for so many years? Well, for me, it was all part of a natural process. Mm -hmm. The music that I grew up listening to and the reason why I wanted to play music and the reason why I started playing was the music of the groups of Miles Davis, John Coltrane, uh, all of the sidemen that played with Miles that became such great leaders, you know, Herbie Hancock, Keith Jarrett, Wayne Shorter, all of these incredible musicians, that's the music that I grew up listening to. Mm -hmm. You know, my first record, my first jazz record was kind of blue. My mother gave me that for, for a Christmas present. I had just started playing the saxophone and she, gave, and she joined the Columbia Record Club uh -huh. and the freebie for that year uh -huh was kind of blue you know so that's where I started that's where I came in so I always had that central focus so when I came out to Los Angeles I, I came out to Los Angeles with Buddy Rich's band uh, when I left Buddy I moved to Los Angeles and I got involved in doing studio work and I'd had never, I didn't even know what studio work was when I was with Buddy Rich. You know, it's like when I left Buddy's band, I figured I would come to L.A. and see if I could get with another band. You know, mm -hmm. maybe tr maybe try to get with Cannonball's band or somebody's or, or or another group to continue to keep playing. And then I started getting calls for record dates, and this whole thing evolved. You know, yeah. uh, but the the s my central focus was always playing jazz. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did a lot of studio work for a long time, but the dream and the concept and the focus was still there within me, you know. So the studio work wasn't really what I came to do. Right. So at a certain point it was just time for me to change, turn the page. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was a very natural transition to go from doing the studio work and, and, and playing sessions and stuff to doing my own music and uh, traveling and recording and that, uh, that kind of road life or whatever you'd yeah. like to call it. Uh, the whole time I was doing studio work in LA, I always had a group, I always had a quartet uh, we would rehearse once a week, and then we had a place we played every week. There was a little club in North Hollywood called Dante's, mm -hmm. and we used to work there every Tuesday night. You know, so I always had an outlet, even though, you know, I always had a jazz outlet, even though yeah. I was doing a lot of studio work for a while. Did that dream uh, start before Kind of Blue? You were playing the saxophone already? Well, I didn't know. I didn't. I started when I was 13, 12 or 13 in grade 7. Mm -hmm. And so that was about that time that mm -hmm. that record came out. So what happened was I had taken up the saxophone. I was practicing every day. My mother and father weren't having to bug me to get in the room and practice. I would go in and practice. So my mother realized, well, you know, the kid's actually interested. He's not going to put this thing down. You know, he's not going to quit. You know, so they began to support me. So part of them supporting me was, you know, that Christmas they gave me a little, I grew up out of the Sears catalog, right? Yeah. So they gave me a little silver tone stereo record player right and it was this record yeah, player the where the front came out. off sure. yeah you know yeah. And that made it stereo right I you had took one. the speaker <laughs> off the front and you put it over here right yeah. so they they got i got my silver tone stereo and my mother joined the columbia record club and she you know she didn't know my folks were not music people so they didn't know about mu instruments or whatever you know but she saw that this was she joined the club and the freebie the first record 
was uh, was the kind of blue, mm. and so that's how I got involved in with that. And then I had a neighbor that was a jazz fan. My next door neighbor was a jazz fan, and uh, he started to lend me records. Mm -hmm. So I mean, one of the first records he ever loaned me was uh, Dave Brubeck's "Jazz Goes to College," mm -hmm. and I heard Paul Desmond. And that was very encouraging for me because I was just starting to play. I was listening to the records and tr trying to play along with the records. And Paul Desmond played so lyrically and so song-like, there were things that he played that I could play, mm -hmm. that I could copy. So that was very encouraging. Yeah. You know? And then it sort of c continued to grow from there. When you were doing that, um, did you get a sense of these guys are improvising, first of all, and they're improvising over a form. Can you recall if you were thinking that, or we, we were just like trying to nail what they were playing? The forms I could hear, I could hear song forms. Uh, I didn't know anything about chords or keys, but I could play, I played by ear and I matched the sound. You know, I was studying, I was taking lessons, you know, mm -hmm. so I was learning how to play the saxophone. I, I was studying classical saxophone, so I was learning how to play the instrument correctly, yeah. technically, you know. But as far as improvising, I learned that from, from playing with records and just from wanting to play, mm -hmm. but I mean, I could I could hear blues choruses and and those kind of things, and then phrases that I could play, I would take off of take off of the record, and then it continued to evolve. See, because all of these things are going on at the same time. You're taking your lesson every week with your teacher. You're learning about the saxophone. You're you're learning about the classical aspect of playing the saxophone, playing transcriptions, uh, playing your lesson book, and that's one aspect. You know, and you're practicing your scales and, 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 and learning how to play the instrument technically, physically correct. Embouchure, fingering, tonguing, okay. That's the craft that you're learning uh, from your teacher. But also along with that, I was listening to jazz records, and the main reason I was listening to jazz records was because I wanted to hear other people play my instrument. Mm -hmm. My folks didn't play. They just listened to what was on the radio. On the radio at that time, it was the birth of rock and roll. Yeah. So the only saxophones that you would hear on the radio would be whoever was playing with Bill Haley and the Comets. Uh, you'd hear King Curtis with the, with the platters or, you know, Charlie Brown, those things. I yeah. think they were King Curtis uh -huh. solos, those, those kind of R&B solos. Uh, I remember one of the first pop saxophone pieces that was on the radio was Earl Bostic. Mm -hmm. There was some Earl Bostic on the radio, but other than that, it was rock and roll people in bands, and I wanted to hear more saxophone than was on the radio, so I started borrowing my friend's records, my next door neighbor's records, and then I st the records that he, l he lent to me were major recordings. So as I was growing up learning how to play the saxophone, playing by ear, I was learning some of the most evolved stuff of the time, and I just thought that's the way everybody played. Mm -hmm. I thought that was the way you played. You know, I heard Coltrane on Kind of Blue, and I said, well, that's, yeah, that's what I want to do. Yeah, it wasn't like... That's the, that's the stuff, <laughs> you know, and so that's where I came in. I figured, well, that's the way you play the saxophone. <laughs> You know, you li you hear Cannonball, you hear Coltrane, you hear you hear Sonny Rollins and 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 Stan Getz and those guys. That's the way it's supposed to sound. You don't think about that being incredibly difficult. You don't think about it being incredibly harmonically evolved. You don't think about how great these guys are. You just say, well, that's the way everybody sounds, <laughs> because that's all you ever heard. Right. Right? That's great. So I'm a kid, I'm 14 or 15 years old, and the only stuff I've ever heard was the best stuff there was. <laughs> <laughs> no one had a chance to ruin you, you yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. Like, so it was hilarious. I said, yeah. well, okay. Yeah. You know, and that's where I started. Wow. You know. Yeah. Now, what kind of experience would you have had 
that would allow you to step into Buddy Rich's band, for instance? Well, I was always a practicer. Mm -hmm. So all through high school, I was studying and practicing. Uh, during high school, I performed classical uh, concerts. Uh, I played with the I played with my hometown orchestra with uh, in Wilmington, Delaware. I performed a very famous saxophone piece by Jacques Bear called mm -hmm. Concertina de Camera. Played that with orchestra. I won a bunch of uh, solo competitions uh, for classical music. Mm -hmm. I was also playing with my friends. We were practicing down in the basement. I was playing little dances, all kinds of stuff like that. So that was all through high school. I graduated from high school and I went to the Westchester State Teachers College, it was called at the time. My mother thought that I should get a teacher's degree in order to have some security right. to fall back on. So I went to Westchester State Teachers College for one year for my mother. It was a disaster. It didn't work for me. So I dropped out. I taught privately in the parochial schools in Wilmington, Delaware, clarinet and saxophone. And then I, I applied for a scholarship. I applied for a downbeat scholarship to the Berklee School of Music in Boston. And I won one of those scholarships. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was a winner that year. Uh, my friend Alan Broadbent was a winner that very same year, and he came over on a boat from uh, New Zealand oh. to Berkeley to come to school. So that's when I met Alan Broadbent. Uh, I went up to Berkeley, and I was practicing, and I was playing and studying. You know, I was just, I from the time I got into it, I was totally focused. So, you know, I lean... By the time I was 15, I, de I, had de I knew that I w wanted to be a musician. So I've always thought as a musician. So everything I did was focused in that area. So I got to the Berkeley School. I was there about a year and a half. Buddy Rich had made his first big band album. I think it was called West Side Story in LA. They were on a tour. Uh, Gene Quill, who was a very great mm -hmm. alto saxophonist, had done the record and was with Buddy's band touring. They got to Boston. Gene Quill got bugged and quit and went back to New York. Uh, the band, Buddy's band, was in a uh, uh, situation. Uh, the manager of the band, who was a man named Jim Trimble, called Phil Wilson who was a teacher, a trombone teacher at Berkeley, and asked who, the, who he would recommend to come out with Buddy's band for a few days until they could get an, a real saxophone player. <laughs> uh, you got any kids over there that can play some parts until yeah. we find a saxophone player, yeah. you know. So I was the kid that got recommended, and I joined Buddy Rich's band, and I was there for two years. Uh -huh. And I made three or four records with Buddy. Yeah. That's how, I, that's how I joined Buddy's band. That's how I got to Los Angeles. I went to Los Angeles on, on a tour with Buddy. Uh, up until that point, I had always thought of, of living in New York. I'd always considered living in New York because that's where all the players were. That's where all the music was for me. Uh, I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, so I was an East Coast person. But I went out to California with Buddy, and I just fell in love with the space. I really liked the hills. I really liked the feeling of spatialness there. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I was with Buddy's band, we did a TV show. We were in L.A. for 13 weeks, and we did a summer replacement for the, uh, for the uh, Jackie Gleason show. And it was a show that Buddy Rich had with Buddy Greco. Uh -huh. It was called Away We Go. And it was 13 weeks. We were all in town for 13 weeks. And while I was there doing that TV show, I met a lot of the musicians in LA. I started doing some rehearsal bands and just meeting other people. And when I left Buddy's band, I decided to settle in Los Angeles rather than New York because I figured I would be starting from scratch either place. And uh, when, I, when I moved to L.A., I realized that more people knew about me than I thought 
because of Buddy's band yeah. and the records and stuff. And so I started working. I started doing studio calls. I started subbing. I started working as a substitute for people like Buddy Collette. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a great player, uh, Bill Green. And uh, these guys were doing so many record dates. It was so busy that they couldn't take all the work. And so they would sub things out. Or, you know, or one guy would have like the Academy Awards, but he couldn't make all the rehearsals. So he'd sub it out, you'd do two rehearsals for the Academy Awards, but and then they'd come in. But all the time, you're meeting other people, uh -huh. and all of these yeah. things are happening, right? Yeah. It's all relationships. Sure. So it just e evolved into this thing, you know, where I was working all the yeah. time, continually. Was, was Buddy the taskmaster that most people say he was? It depends on who you talk to. Mm -hmm. If you know my background, if you know who I am, I'm hard enough on myself. I'm a taskmaster master on myself. So when I work with somebody who is, who is a disciplinarian, it doesn't bother me because uh, he's half as hard on me as I am mm. on myself anyway. Uh, if you're someone who is not disciplined, if you're someone who is not focused, then he could be perceived as a difficult person. Uh, one of his sayings was, you know, th there's 24 hours in the day. He needs you to be responsible for four hours out of the day. Whatever you do the other 20 hours of the day is your job, is your business, you know what I mean? Whatever you do, that's your business. Four hours a day, he needs you to be responsible on the gig. If you can't keep it together for four hours a day, then you shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, people talk about his temper and that whole thing. And he would go off and he would get angry. Uh, the problem that he had was he, wouldn't, he could not make a point and stop. You know, he would get an adrenaline rush for, from, from anger, you know. But I never saw him get angry for no reason. You know, there was, a, there was usually a reason that he would get angry. There was usually something that had happened, and he would get angry about it, and he was correct. But the problem that he had was he couldn't state his point and then cool out. You know, and so that's when that's where all the stories come yeah. from. Okay, yeah. who were your section mates um, that time? Was it Carmen Leggio or Menza? This was in nineteen sixty, yeah, sixty six, five, sixty six. So when I came on the band, there the the tenor player was Jay Corey. Oh yeah, uh, there was. Uh, Bobby Porcelli was the other alto player when I came on, and uh, uh, boy, I forget the baritone player's name. Uh, Bobby Shue was there, and shortly after that, Chuck Finley came mm -hmm. on. Uh, as I stayed, um, Jay Corey left, Don Menza took his place. Don was there for a while. Uh, Charlie Owens came from from Boston and played the other alto book. So I played alto, I played lead alto. Charlie Owens played uh, second alto. Don Menza played tenor. Uh, Pat LaBarbera was there, yeah, yeah. and uh, Joe Kalo played baritone for quite a while. And uh, Bobby Shue and Chuck Finley were in the trumpet section, and it was a very good band. For sure. Yeah. It's all on record, too. Yeah, for quite a while. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those were some good records. Well, the studio thing, um, th there's more involved than just being a good player. Uh, you have to be a good player first, right? Good well, yeah, that's the, that's the, yeah, that's the given. A good right. reader. Right. Yeah. Um, but your reputation also depends on being on time and dependable. Right, right. Uh, it's all relationships like everything, you know. So it's about how you get along with people. 
being responsible, you know, showing up on time, all of that, taking care of business. I'm a woodwind player also, so when I was doing a lot of studio work, I was playing all the saxophones, soprano, alto, tenor, and baritone saxophone, clarinet and bass clarinet, piccolo, flute, alto, flute, and bass flute, and I also played oboe and English horn. Wow. Were those kind of self-taught and... Uh, I studied oboe and English horn at Berkeley with Joe Viola. He was my saxophone teacher. He decided to teach me oboe and English horn. So I learned oboe and English horn reed making techniques and all of that at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I taught myself to play the flute and then that technique goes through all the flutes. You know, it's just a matter of spending time with them. And I taught myself also to play clarinet from books and listening to records, classical records, listening to great players, yeah. you know, and then you just copy the sound. You get the sound from hearing, from just hearing good sounds all the time. Uh, the times you were with Oliver Nelson must have been enjoyable, can I assume that? Yeah, that was right after I moved to LA. Yeah. And, uh, I play with Oliver's big band in LA. Uh, we used to do clubs, and uh, I also did a three-month State Department tour to Africa. Uh, it was West French Africa, Chad, Niger, Mali, Senegal, that whole area. Uh, and I did uh, uh, quite a few TV shows with Oliver. Mm. He did The Six Million Dollar Man and some other TV. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you were d doing a particular date, did you ever have a sense of this tune or this date is going to last? This is going to sell records. It's going to be something that, you know, years from now people are still listening to. No, when you're working, you're just working. Mm -hmm. It's just your work. It's just what you do. I mean, I was doing like I would get up in the morning and I'd go and I'd do a record date and it could be the Jacksons or it could be uh, Sarah Vaughn or, or it could be uh, Barbara Streisand. You know, I did pop records, I did jazz records, I'd go and I'd do a record date in the morning and then in the afternoon was The Tonight Show. So I, I, the record dates usually run three hours so I'd do a date from 10 until 1, take a break go over to The Tonight Show, do The Tonight Show. The Tonight Show would be off at 6.30 and I'd do another record date at 7, right? So I'd usually do two record dates in The Tonight Show just about every day or I'd do three record dates or a big movie date and I'd send a sub to The Tonight Show because <laughs> sometimes, you know, movie dates are all day long. I did that every day for 20 years, you know. So when you're doing that, all you're doing really, all you're thinking about is keeping your health together yeah. and going to work, uh -huh. you know. You have absolutely no idea of the greatness of what's going on or how something's going to last or whatever. What's happening now is all of these R&B records that I played on with The Temptations and Barry White and all of these people, they're being used for commercials. And I'm getting these big checks. I'm getting these checks for, for Billy Preston things and oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, we'll that go around in circles and Will all that stuff. Will he go around in circles? Nothing from nothing. Yeah. All of that stuff. They're big commercials now. Or they use these things for TV themes. And there's all of these reuse checks yeah. that come in. I said, did I play on that? <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's cool. <coughs> it's hilarious. Yeah. yeah. You know? And well, at the time you're doing it, you're just going to work, you know? It's nice that they. They're keeping records <coughs> and, uh, you know, that it's working. Well, there's a union record of all of that stuff yeah. because it was all union work. So you fill out a contract. You know, there's a contract. There's, it's W-4 income with withholding and pension and all of that stuff if it's mm -hmm. union work. Yeah. So that was good. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the whole time, all the time I'm doing all of these record dates and TV and all of that stuff, I'm still thinking, man, this isn't it, you know. I should be I should be playing this yeah. isn't playing yeah you know it's like it's craft okay. you know that's the thing that I learned in, uh, in, in, in LA LA is an incredible place for craft you really learn 
you learn to play your instrument well, you learn to play in tune, you learn to show up on time. All of those disciplines, the disciplines of the craft, are there. But your soul, your spirit, you know, is not usually nurtured. Every now and then there's a date, every now and then, you know, somebody like Herbie Hancock will do a film or somebody, you know, or Oliver would or, or Oliver would have a record date or or someone that you really, really love would do something. And it would be a special thing and that would feel special. You know, those things disappear. The stuff that you did that you thought was just work, you know, that stuff's around forever. The Commodores, Brick House, all of that stuff, the, the, the earth, wind, and fire, way of the world, all of that stuff I played on. And that's all like legendary R&B stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, Man. it's wild, you know. Tell but me you don't th think of it when you're doing it. Yeah. You're on a Cannonball record, and uh, I wondered how that came about. He's a, he's a big, I'm a, let's say I'm a big fan of his, and I just wondered how that came about. Well, I grew up listening to Cannon. And I met him when I was in high school. He came to the University of Delaware and did a concert. And I was a kid, I didn't know. I walked up, I said, hi, can I try your horn? He says, well, I've got to do this concert now and I don't want to mess up my read, but come back after the concert and I'll let you play my horn. So I came back after the concert, he let me play his horn. That's great. That was the band with, that was the band with Youssef. Was he playing a king that. at the time? Yeah, he was playing the yeah. Super 20. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I met him then, and then I didn't see him for years. And then we got back together again when I was in L.A. because he was doing records. He had a TV show. He was producing some other people. And his producer and his partner at uh, Capitol Records was a guy named uh, David Axelrod. Mm -hmm. I was doing dates for David. And we got back, I got back together with Cannonball through David. And then I did like two, I did a live record at the Troubadour. I did a thing called the Jazz, uh, it was, it was, oh, the, the, uh, the horoscope. There oh, was Zodiac. A, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And there was, a, and there was a, uh, Rick Holmes, who was a, a, a disc jockey in L.A., and he did narrations, and we did music for each of the signs. Yeah. I don't know what happened with that. Cannonball had a TV show. Yeah, I he just, had a talk I'd show. love to see that. I yeah, and I played that. on that. So we knew each other. We knew each other pretty well. And I knew Nat very well. That too. Troubadour date was interesting because there was some. I think yeah, Mike Dacey people, was people on it. Mike Dacey was on it. Ierto yeah. was on it. Yeah, yeah. And it was very interesting yeah. when we recorded for a week there. Uh huh. So it was good. What was he like as a person for you? Very natural, just like you know, just like on all the records when he talked and did his introductions and all of that kind of stuff. He was just sort of like that, mm -hmm. you know, very uh, open. Very hospitable guy, yeah. And he, you know, he got his nick. He, Cannonball is from Cannibal, and if you ever hung out with him, this guy could eat. He had a party at his house, and Alvin Alvin Baptiste, Alvin uh, Baptiste, yeah, clarinet, the, man, clarinet yeah. player. His wife and Alvin, they came up from 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 Atlanta, and she made this gumbo. And I mean, it was like in a cauldron, you know, it was like in a witch's cauldron. And Cannon ate half of that. It was incredible. <laughs> wow. Trying to live up to his original Yeah, nickname. I mean, yeah. that was, that, I mean, wow. he was like that, you know. He's like everything he did was 200%. Uh-huh. Yeah. Wow. A um, couple more things I just in, the, in that realm. Frank Zappa. What was that like? The music was very difficult. Uh, he was like a, cl a contemporary classical composer that happened to play rock and roll mm -hmm. guitar. I mean, he was very, very bright, very bright man. And he knew his music and he knew what he wanted and all of that stuff was scored out. I mean, it was like, you know, it was like classical composition. And when you hear his stuff, it's very similar. 
you know, it's very similar to similar to contemporary classical, mm-hmm. and it's, it was difficult stuff. You know, it was like playing Stravinsky. Very good music. Boy, it must have been hard for him to get the kind of players who could handle that. I would think in the rock world. Well, yeah, it was. It was L.A. would be the place that that would be, though, because there were really good players that were familiar with a lot of different forms, mm-hmm. and so he had jazz players that were really good readers that could play classical things and play rock. And he had rock players that were good, pl- that were really good players, and could go over into the other, into the other side. You mm-hmm. know, so he knew how to put that together. But uh, I don't know; he couldn't have done it in any other place but L.A. and maybe New York. You know, for the level of the musicians. Right. Did some of those th- things seem? Oh gosh. Weird. At the time for you. Nothing is weird after you listen to Ascension and okay. all of those Coltrane things, which I grew up with. I yeah. mean, I grew up listening to free music. Yeah. I mean, what I came into kind of blue was sort of the beginning of that, and Coltrane took the mo- the modal improvisation thing, and then he just took it on out. Yeah. And that was the stuff I hooked into because I hooked into Coltrane with Miles Band. So as soon as he went to Impulse... And, you know, 14 minutes of impression and chasing the train and all of that stuff, that was, that was the blues to me. <laughs> that was like, hey, that was it. You know, so that's what I... <laughs> you can't shock yeah, me Yeah, I mean, I had to relearn. I had to learn about chords. I had to learn about bebop. I had to learn about two five ones and all of that stuff because the music I came into was free modal music, mm-hmm. you know. So I had to come back to Charlie Parker yeah. and Dexter and Lester and all of those people. But I did because I love all of that music, you know. But so anyway, going to Zappa, no, nah, Zappa wasn't weird because where I was coming from made Zappa look like, you know, Bill Haley. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Depends on where you're coming yeah. from, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, you've got a very distinctive sound. And I'm wondering if, uh, was there a period of trying different mouthpieces and all that, and, and were you trying to sound like somebody to, to arrive at your own thing? No, it evolved. It evolved through the music business. The only person I ever really tried to sound like was Train, because mm-hmm. that was where I'm coming from. You know, that's where I plugged into it. So everybody has someone they emulate when they're a kid, when they're sure. learning how to play. So Coltrane was it for me. Uh, I developed my sound, interestingly enough, from playing pop music. When you play pop music, when you play pop solos on all of these records and you have eight bars in the middle of the tune and then you get to play on the fade while they fade it out and then, you know, the DJ tries to fade it out as fast as he can, you know. Yeah. As soon as they hear the vocal in and the saxophone starts, you're out of there. <laughs> you know, unless you bought the record, you know, and then you get to hear the saxophone solo <laughs> goes for like 20 bars at the end yeah. of some of these yeah. things. But on the radio, as soon as the DJ hears the saxophone solo, you're out of there, you know. <laughs> So <laughs> so anyway, I started working on my sound and concentrating on my sound when I realized with pop music, in order for it to be pop music, it has to be within a certain genre. It's set up a certain way production-wise. It's set up a certain way harmonically. It's very simple, structured music. As a soloist within that genre, you can't do anything harmonically. You can't play chromatically through that music. You can't do anything in that music that is intricate or evolved on a technical or harmonic level because at that point it's not pop music. Mm-hmm. You, take, you take that music to a different place and it's out of context with the music, therefore it is not right for the music. So you don't go to, a, you know, you don't go to a, a pop session and play a Charlie Parker solo. So what happens is 
the idiom of the music is so simple harmonically that the only way you can establish a style is to have a sound that is recognizable so that when you play one note when you play three notes it's recognizable because it's a unique tone quality mm. and I recognize that in the music and so I develop my sound you know it's a combination of the stuff I grew up listening to it's a combination of, of, of Coltrane with a softer edge yeah. but it's still that center and it's still that intensity mm -hmm. but it's just it's just very simplified if you could go back <laughs> through all those things you did and you had some students and, and you wanted to show them examples of that could you pick out two or three of, of solos that you had done that maybe you're not proud of them for all those things that you mentioned that you can't do but that they were in the context of the song and that that you felt that they were good pieces. Oh, there's a good one on uh, "Find 100 Ways." That's Quincy's album, the uh, the dude. It's just very melodic. Mm -hmm. There's an alto one that's real good on Arthur. That I did with uh, Christopher Cross. Uh, boy, there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Things with Bill Withers that are very melodic. Uh, Quite a few. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell someone uh, if you have a, have a student about how to play melodic? Yeah, the basic thing is to think like a singer. The saxophone is a voice. The saxophone is a, sings a song. So when you hear a, when you hear a tune. And when you hear a uh, production or anything, when you hear a jazz tune, uh, we always, as a saxophonist, you always approach the music from a melodic point. That's how I learned to play. Before I learned about scales, before I learned about chords, before I learned about anything, what I did was I listened to records and I responded to melody with melody. After you learn about chords and harmony and rhythm and everything else, when you get up and play, you still respond to melody with melody. You try to create something beautiful that is within the context of the idiom you're performing in. But you're always striving to create something that's beautiful. So it's always a vocal approach. It's always like a singer to me. You know, all the things I do with Charlie Hayden, I've done like five albums with Charlie Hayden with the Quartet West. Quartet projects, string projects, uh, big string projects, you know, where we worked with, with Shirley Horn and, and uh, Bill Henderson. Always in that music, I think of myself as singing mm -hmm. it's always it's always singing it's always about about melody you know it's a great answer actually um, this is just an aside do you happen to know who the tenor player is on um, the classics for recordings spooky and in those things no okay mm -mm. Some good sound on there. I always mm -hmm. wondered who that person was. Mm -hmm. Could have been someone in the band, actually. I don't mm -hmm. know. But um, so, when you've decided in the last number of years to cut down on your studio work, did did you have to sort of make an announcement, or did you just kind of start turning down? Work? I did an interesting thing. I've, I've done. A, I I live my life intuitively. I always follow my heart. I got I I can almost tell you the day when I did my last record date that was fun. You know what I mean? It was like one day mm. the switch clicked 
and I said, you know, this is, it's time to turn the page. This is not bringing me joy. This is not happening. And then from that point on, I started to evolve into my next chapter. Now what I did was, and I didn't think about it logically or anything else, but what I did was I took my body out of the scene. I bought a house in Colorado in 1987. I bought a house, six acres of property, and I moved to Colorado physically because I knew if I stayed in L.A. and somebody called me, you know, if I stayed in L.A. and I said, you know, I'm going to practice and write tomorrow and just work on my music and get some stuff together, and then the phone rings at 8 o'clock in the morning and somebody wants you to help them out on a date or there's a dog food commercial or whatever, you know, you take the gig, right? You say, oh, man, I was going to write today, but I can really use this bread. So you get in the car, you drive for an hour and a half, you take 20 minutes to find a parking place, you go in the studio, you warm up, you do this jingle that takes an hour, but then it takes you an hour and a half to drive home. And by the time you get home, you're so bugged and you're so frazzled, you don't feel like practicing, you don't feel like doing anything, you know, and the day is bummed out, right? So I took my body out of L.A. so that I wouldn't be there. And I started doing my own things and working with Charlie Hayden and special concerts and, you know, doing some things with Pat Metheny here and there and different people working. I work with Lee Rittenauer, mm -hmm. do some fusion things, all kinds of projects. And then that evolved. And that evolved to the point where I'm doing my own special projects and stuff like that all the time. Clinics, my concerts, tours of Europe, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I moved back to L.A because I, was nev I never could get to Colorado anyway. I had the place for 13 years, never could get there. Oh, you know, gee. I got there like three weeks a year, uh -huh. you know. So I sold it a, a year and a half ago, and I moved back to L.A. So now I'm back in L.A., but I'm doing all of my traveling and everything, and I do a date here and there. But I'm not on the call list anymore. Okay. See, it's like when you're in, when you're in Los Angeles, when you're a studio musician, you're, you're on... It's like out of sight, out of mind. I used to tell people, it takes 15 minutes for everybody in town to know you're out of town. It takes three months for everybody in town to know you're back in town, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the way that thing works. You know, as long as you're there sitting by the telephone all the time, you're there to take calls. As soon as you go out of town, everybody thinks you're out of town. And, and then you come back, and you have to remind them that you're not out of town for three months. <laughs> so, so taking, like, you know, in the middle of that thing, taking a, uh, something comes up where you can go on this great tour with these great people for a week. Right. You got to think carefully about doing that because it's going to affect well, your life. Well, yeah, if you're in if you're involved in the studio thing and you have that fear, then you have to try to figure out how to get out of town for a week and get back without telling anybody. Oh. You know, yeah. so you leave your answering service on, you take your calls, you do all of that stuff. You just don't tell anybody you're out of town. <laughs> you know. So, yeah, there's a lot of guys. I mean, I mean, when I was doing studio work, there were guys that were afraid to go out of town because somebody else might get their gig. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all of that fear, you know. Uh, but anyway, now I've gone back and I do what I, you know, I do what I want to do. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. So the projects you've done for JVC, when you have a recording project coming up you've got decisions to make about personnel right material uh, regarding material is there a uh, any pressure or let's say suggestions from the record company about actual songs to go on this record you know are you free to do your own music and, and pick your own it depends on the situation. With JVC, I, uh, I picked all my music. 
Mm -hmm. And if the if the producer had any questions, we would talk about it. But usually when I do a record, I have an idea, I have a concept of what I want to do. And I can, I'm pretty good at putting my ideas together and picking the tunes and presenting the idea. And most of the time, uh, you know, the people that I'm, other people in production that I'm involved with, they're agreeable. Yeah, so there's not a problem with that. Mm -hmm. And now I'm older. And when you get to a certain age, you really don't care about what anybody else thinks anymore. And I just do what I feel. And if they don't agree with me, then we, we work it out. You know, we work it out. And if it's, really a ba if it's really not an agreement at all, then we just can't do the project. You know, because you can't do, you can't play music with people that you don't have a harmonious feeling with. You can't do production work with people where you're spending hours and hours in the studio if you don't agree on the music. You have to surround yourself with people who are in a harmonious vibration with you in order for the music to happen. You know, and if I don't feel good about something, I'm out of there. You know, period. I don't do stuff for money mm -hmm. because I, I'm, I don't, I'm not ruled by money. You know, so if it's not feeling good, I'm gone. You know, and there's no scene, there's nothing like that. It's just like after the rehearsal or after whatever, there's a quiet dinner somewhere. And I say, well, you know, I'm not going to be able to, to do this because I don't feel good about it. Mm -hmm. Just being really and honest about it. it. Yeah, I have to be honest because yeah. that's the only thing that works. If you're not honest, if you're not straight with yourself, at some point it comes up behind you and bites you in the butt. <laughs> 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 so in order to live with yourself, you have to be straight. Yeah. We're in the middle of this uh, huge convention about jazz, and uh, sometimes it, it seems really positive. And then you're thinking, well, maybe it's not really realistic. <laughs> 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 what's your <laughs> What's your opinion on this the state of, you know, maybe not just jazz. <laughs> I'm just wondering what, w in a sense, about, about live music and the recording business. Is that possible to address that big subject? Sure, it is. I mean. Everybody has their own views. You know, I'm going to give you my disclaimer now. You know, it's just, it's just like all statements that will be coming forth are the concept and the ideas of the one individual, Ernie Watts. This mm -hmm. is my concept, right? It's just my idea. Everybody has an idea. There's a lot of good in, in what's going on. There's a lot of change in what's going on. See, what's happened is, for jazz players, for jazz music, there's no place to play anymore. There's no jam sessions, there's no clubs, there's no place for young people to learn how to play from guys on the bandstand that kick their butt every night and then they come back the next night and maybe they can get through the tune a little better. All of that stuff is transferred to the schools, okay? Now the problem with that is you've taken an art form that's a music that was a, an individual communication with people and it's become institutionalized. Now people are writing papers on Charlie Parker. And Patricia and I were laughing the other night and was like, man, if Bird were here, he'd be cracking up. He would yeah. be falling down, you know. And then, we yeah. sa and then we were saying, yeah, but he'd have a lot more bread. You know, <laughs> he'd have an honorary doctorate at the University of Illinois. And you know, you know what I yeah, mean? He, he, uh, Dizzy saw some of this, Yeah, you know. Uh, and these are the guys that, you know, they open that door. The schools are keeping the music alive. But we were also talking about endangered species, right? The zoos are keeping the tiger, the Bengal tiger, alive. 
right? And all of these incredible animals that would be gone in Borneo if it wasn't for game parks and zoos, right? Mm -hmm. The schools are keeping jazz alive, but the price that's being paid is institution institutionalization, the institutionalization of this thing. Uh, Bach and Beethoven and these guys, when they wrote their music, they wrote their music in their house. It was what they did. It came from their heart, and they died for it or whatever, you know. Uh, then somebody came along and wrote a book about it. Somebody went through all of Bach's music and wrote out the formula of how he wrote this stuff. And now there's universities all over the world where people study Bach and they write three-part inventions and whatever in the style of Bach. That's part of, their, that's part of their education. That's part of how they get through the university, you know. And so now the kids are doing transcriptions of Sonny Rollins solos. Mm -hmm. Same kind of thing. It's academia. Uh, that's an observation. It's not good. It's not bad. It's just an observation. Mm -hmm. And it's keeping the music alive, you know? Yeah. And that's a good thing. And out of all of this, there are individual people, there are young players who are gifted and very bright who will come through this and this music will continue, you know. So I think it's a good thing. You know, it's a good thing any way people can have an opportunity to grasp this music, you know. I don't know about the deification of John Coltrane and Cannonball and, and, uh, and, and the players. They were just guys, Yeah. you know. So uh, they were guys that loved music and they practiced and they had whatever their gift was and they put it together with some discipline and it came together. You know, we can, you know, they worked hard. Yeah. I sometimes wonder how they would feel when they look at the articles on, you know, where someone will transcribe a solo and then they'll analyze every phrase and how it related to the chord change underneath and what was played six bars before that, if those kinds of things came natural to them, and to analyze it to death, I don't know if it, what's the purpose well, of Well, see, in an academic environment, that's necessary in order for there to be something uh, that can be graded, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, you know, it's like in order to get a doctorate, you have to have a paper. There's so many doctorates and there's so many papers that people are running out of stuff to write papers about, you know. So they'll write a paper for their doctoral thesis on whether John, John Coltrane used an eraser when he was writing a lead sheet or if he just wrote the lead sheet straight through or, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's come to that. Minutia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically, though, the music is there. And when you get past the things that people have to do to keep their jobs, the music that is there that all of this stuff is based on is some really great, incredible music. So the kid that has to do the transcription of the Sonny Stitt solo or the Sonny Rollins solo or whatever, after he listens to that thing 40 or 50 times like he has to in order to write it down, he's going to get the grasp of what it is, what it is inside of it, you know? Mm -hmm. so and I think that's the most important thing is that people feel, you know. And when you hear music and when you hear some of these great performances and you hear these people play, it creates a feeling. 
and that's what keeps you going on. You know, what keeps you going on is this beautiful, beautiful feeling of love that's in this music. No matter how screwed up Miles Davis was, you know, and there's 25 books about how screwed up Miles Davis was, uh, or whoever, right? When you put all that crap down and you listen to the music, it's undeniably great and it's undeniably beautiful. And that's all that it's about. All that it's about is how it makes you feel. And if it makes you feel loved inside, then it's worthwhile. It doesn't matter whether Miles Davis beat up his wife that morning, mm -hmm. you know? It matters to him, you know, it matters to the police station, you know, but the music is there. You know, and then I think that's what everything else comes out of. All of this confusion comes out of that, trying to explain all of that so that you can do it too. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> you're not going to do it yeah. too. You're going to do what you do. You know, you can be influenced by Miles Davis, you can be influenced by John Coltrane, you can be influenced by Charlie Parker, but you can't be them. Yes. You can read all the books. You can play all the transcriptions. You can write all the transcriptions. You can pray on your knees every night until they bleed, but you're not going to be them. So you might as well get to who you are and get inside of you and be you. <laughs> <laughs> some some you know, great thoughts there. That's you know, really good. Because we don't have any choice with that. Yeah, that's right. You know, we're stuck with us. Right. So we might as well take what we are and try to make the best it can yeah. be. <laughs> What's coming up yeah. in the near future for you? We're going to Montana tomorrow. And uh, I have a concert there. Uh, I'm doing some recording there with some friends. There's a friend of mine, uh, Harry Blazer, that uh, has a home studio there. And uh, playing with uh, another friend, great bass player, Abraham Laboreal, mm -hmm. and uh, Ron Foyer. And we're doing a uh, we're we're doing some recording up there of, of of some music of ours, and we're doing a clinic and a concert for the community in uh, Whitefish and uh, Kalispell, that area. And then we go from there back to LA, and I have a concert in Santa Barbara with Charlie Hayden. And then we go from uh, there to Europe, and I have some concerts of my own, and uh, a two or three week tour this time. We're mm -hmm. going to Kiev, and we're also going to uh, uh, Istanbul, Istanbul. <laughs> <laughs> and then around Germany and stuff. And, uh, and it just goes on like that. Then I come back and get ready for the next tour. Mm -hmm. So it's very busy. Good. Yeah. Well, it's been a great pleasure talking to you today. Well, thank you. Most yeah, it's great talking with you, Mom. Thank you very much. Right, thank you.